And, uh, and I and my staff who are here today are very happy to have some time today to, to, to join us again for our monthly Newport Lecture Series presentation. Uh, a wonderful opportunity, obviously, for all of you and, and uh, perhaps some of your friends to interact with some of the terrific Naval War College faculty that we have at that great institution. And uh, certainly, uh, I'm indebted to all of them for their terrific support of foundation events such as this. Um, I get the, uh, just, uh, obviously, pr a pretty good crowd tonight, so I just want to say we're going to finish at 7 o'clock p.m. That'll be our that'll be our goal. I know sometimes many of you have other engagements afterwards, uh, so don't be, don't be surprised if you cut it off at 7. Uh, but I know uh, Dr. Irvine has got, got plenty of opportunity built into his, uh, in his, into his presentation to, uh, to give you some, some of your interaction questions and, and answers. Also, what I'm going to try to do is my staff will be around when Q&A starts. I'm going to try to get you a microphone just so you can use that and everybody else present and clearly hear the question that you're, that you're offering up to uh, Dr. Reverend. Uh, that being said, uh, I get to introduce uh, Dr. Reverend. He's got a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science at Rush at the University of Illinois at Chicago, where, of course, he graduated with honors. We don't hire anybody unless I graduated with honors. Neil Warcock. Uh, he received his Master of Arts in Political Science from the University of Illinois as well in Chicago, where he specialized in Eastern European political culture and American politics. Uh, he participated in the Naval War Fleet Seminar Program at Snupchuk, where he graduated with the highest distinction and received the Director's Award for Academic Excellence. And finally, and I say finally, finally he earned his PhD in Public Policy and Analysis from the University of Illinois at Chicago, where he specialized in public policy, democratization, and U.S. foreign policy. Uh, Dr. Uh, Reverend currently serves as the chair of the National Security Affairs Department at the Global War College and is a faculty affiliate at the Belfort Center for Science and International Affairs at the Harvard Kennedy School. Ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, please welcome Dr. Derek Reverend. And so the one thing that, uh, in terms of as I thought about, if you wanted to sort of understand U.S. foreign policy today, what's animating it, is really sort of the focus of what I'm doing. And this is an important question, because I would say at least since, uh, you know, a lot of experts in the room here on, on Soviet Union and collapse, I don't know when you decided it ended. Um, I, I picked 1986. I don't know when you would choose, and we can we can talk about that later or, or where you go. At least the flag came down in Christmas of '91, uh, but I picked '86 because at that point it really seemed clear how things were changing between the U.S. and Soviets, and certainly the summit and Reykjavik is what I have in mind. Uh, but uh, also a lot of stuff going on on the military side too that that we're improving. Uh, but really, probably since '86 and certainly the '90s, the question is, what is U.S. foreign policy about? Uh, and in the 90s, as you know, it was very much about um, democratic enlargement, um, economic expansionism, uh, walls came down literally, money was able to move globally, uh, and uh, a lot of trade, World Trade Organization, and many other things going on. Uh, and, and then, of course, 9-11 happens, the focus becomes terrorism, um, and that leads into some other things. Um, that uh, regime change, stability ops, and, and so on. And uh, it, it not completely satisfying, a lot of that still goes on today. Um, that, you know, the U.S. still has about 14,000 uniformed uh, members in Afghanistan, probably double that on contractors, and then you add in our, our allies from Canada and Europe and some other countries around the world, 
you, you add another 10,000 or more in Afghanistan. Iraq, of course, I think we're somewhere about eight to 10,000 US uniformed, uh, but many more uh, civilians. Uh, Syria you know, and, and down the list. So that's still continuing. But the big debate, I think, you know, even really prior to the election of President Trump was what should be the focus of U.S. foreign policy in light of disappointing results in the Middle East and Central Asia. Uh, and at the same time, you started to see some changes, you know, big changes. Russia invades, um, you know, we start with Georgia, 2008, Russia invades Ukraine, 2014, annexes territory, and the U.S. doesn't have a really great response. You know, I loved at the time Secretary of State John Kerry, you know, said something to, to the effect after Russia annexes Crimea, well, that's very 19th century of you. Uh, and it was that sense, and I, that sort of stuck with me, because it, it's the U.S. was sort of ill-prepared to really think about another country invading another to annex territory, because it just doesn't happen that often. Uh, and uh, lately, you know, in the last 50 years, 70 years. So the, this notion of we need to spend more time, at the same time China's rising, and you know, Hillary Clinton sort of articulated the, the pivot to the Pacific, the rebalance to the Pacific, and that of course sort of continues. Uh, and then when President Trump is elected, the people that are in significant positions, Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis, um, uh, H.R. McMaster, Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster, who had spent a lot of time thinking about Russia and Europe and fighting there, National Security Advisor, gives us this sort of new lens. What should U.S. foreign policy be about? And so sort of the, the acronym of the day, you know, is GPC. Uh, and so I'm just curious, who heard of GPC before sort of the flyer and the foundation? See if that's a household name. So just a few. I know even in my household, my wife asked me before I was coming out here to she said, what are you talking about? Uh, I said, great power competition. Oh, is that a new thing? I'm like, we've been talking about this uh, for like two years. Uh, and so it wasn't quite the household name that containment was or GWAT was, but I think GPC is supposed to be that new, that lens that we're supposed to think about foreign policy. And so in our national defense strategy that the Secretary of Defense signed, uh, so sort of in Mattis, you know, it really highlights this point. Great power competition, not <laughs> terrorism, is now the primary focus. So in a sense, the GPC is giving us a lens, but it's also telling us what not to do. You know, not to be so focused on terrorism. And, and again, these are my personal views, and so I'll, you know, I'll say, well, if I look at from, you know, my, my read my bio, heard my bio, like political science training, to believe in empiricism, you gotta see something. We are engaged in counterterrorism every night. Uh, East Africa, Central Asia, uh, Syria, North Africa, Libya, other places, West Africa. So I understand this of what the intent is, but don't think that the counterterrorism operations have stopped. What's supposed to signal and was supposed to get the military services, the Navy, the Air Force, is to think about what does conflict look like with a great power. So the first question you have to ask is, uh, who, who are we talking about? What, who are these great powers we speak of? Uh, and so these are different excerpts from the major strategic documents that, that the government uh, issued. So you can see China and Russia are the two countries when we say great power competition. Who are the great powers? China and Russia. And in terms of, you know, even jumping down to the Marine Corps strategy, near-pair competitors are now openly challenging previously unmatched U.S. capabilities. I think there was very much an eye-opening that the United States no longer could achieve what we would say full-spectrum dominance. That U.S. military power could be challenged. Uh, challenged on the surface, uh, because Chinese missiles can target U.S. ships. Challenged in the air, because Russia is more active uh, with strategic aviation, challenge under the sea. Uh, and then we looked at sort of ourselves, and we found we let, I would say, significant military combat capabilities disappear. And, and I'll, I'll try to use Navy examples since where we are. You know, the Navy, for example, stopped developing long-range anti-ship missiles. Because what the U.S. Navy had been doing really since, the, I would say, the early 90s is uh, combat power ashore. Um, so Tomahawk missile strikes, uh, so if you remember the 90s, really we start seeing Tomahawk with course of diplomacy, 
uh, and then you know more lately on supporting ground forces. But the idea of actively targeting enemy ships or potential sh enemy ships sort of disappeared. And the same thing with anti-submarine warfare. That was something we used to be very good at. That sort of disappeared in, in the 90s. Um, and, uh, and so the Navy is trying to, to rekindle all that and bring all that back uh, with that lens. Uh, so I guess the other thing too I would sort of caveat is great power competition, it's an assessment, it's not a strategy. And so there's a lot of work going on to understand what does this even mean. And so at least in the talk tonight, I wanted to try to at least sketch some outlines. So the first is we say great power competition. Who are these great powers we speak of? US, China, Russia. And to be honest, that's disputable. Uh, there was a senior military officer who just testified recently before the Congress says, I'm not going to refer to Russia as a great power. They don't deserve that. And, and it goes back to how do you want to define something? Uh, but uh, sort of an interesting thing. Uh, the next thing I guess I would say, competition over what? So we know who we're talking about. Now, what are we competing over? Uh, and so these are, sort of, I think, sort of the big things, right? The first two deal with really the global financial system. So uh, Tom Friedman, everybody loves or hates him, New York Times columnist, he said, look, 9-11 didn't change the world. 11-9 uh, changed the world. November 9th, 1989, Berlin Wall fell. And so from an ideological perspective, money became borderless. You could move money. We had very, very little trade with the Soviets, very little investment with the Soviets. Untrue with China, for example. Up until last year, China was the US number one trading partner. China is the number one trading partner for almost every country in the world. That's very different than Soviet times. Um, and on the transparent financial system, you know, some of the uh, grievances that the United States has with China on trade, some result with this uh, phase one trade deal last month signed, uh, but currency value, currency doesn't float. We like floating currency, market principles. Um, and, uh, and then the third is dispute resolution mechanisms. More diplomatic, more political. Uh, when you have a dispute with your neighbor, you do not invade and annex. When you have disputes with your neighbors, you do not um, build artificial islands in, inside their territory. Um, and then the last one, collective defense. You know, competing, one of the, the things that I'll come back to towards the end is, one of the things that the US has that Russia and China does not have, allies. Allies, that is our comparative advantage. There is no shortage of countries willing to partner or host the United States military. Uh, formally, and I'll show you at the end, uh, it's about 120 countries where we have formal agreements um, where they'll host. China and Russia don't have that, and so that's a real thing, but what China and Russia can do, though, is they can wedge our collective defense. And so, you know, again, personal views, the strength of the alliance with uh, US and Australia is super, super strong, but Australia has to consider trade issues when it comes to China, because Australia relies on exporting raw materials, agriculture to China. That's part of the wedge. Um, you look at the question of Huawei now uh, with the UK. You know, that starts driving a wedge between the US, so it's very subtle. Uh, and then you can look on the Russia example, um, you know, either Russia selling or Turkey buying a Russian air defense system that the US attracted to. Uh, independent country, sovereign country of Turkey made that decision impacts the collective defense. So to be overly dramatic, right, it's a Wednesday night, uh, and uh, I'm disappointed in winter since it's not cold enough. Um, you know, what's at stake here? You know, global balance of power. Highly dramatic, uh, but, but this idea is, it's really, I think, a, it's a very slow moving process, and we're not quite ready to, to get to, to some understanding of that. So, so, what, so that's what we're competing over. What does it look like? So different pictures. So on the one hand, China and Russia. So the top picture of Putin and Xi conferring, working together. Right? They, they have a common adversary, the United States. Uh, and so we see that impacting things a bit. Um, you know, at the tactical level, that's everyone's favorite picture, a US destroyer being intercepted by a Russian fighter. Um, uh, and, and then the next picture, President Xi uh, with Khamenei of Iran, 
Uh, and then last, a U.S. Air Force uh, aircraft being intercepted by a Russian fighter. And so, you know, the, the competition isn't equal. So that, that's sort of my other disclaimer, is we say competition, I don't think it's equal. The U.S. is in a superior position. And so when I start saying, well, what are we, what are we competing? Like, what would this look like again? What do I look for? So, and again, so George, you can, you can jump all over me for this, because I'm giving SCO a little more credit probably than it deserves. But, but this idea that, you know, the G7 countries, um, you know, the seven kind of richest, because China's excluded, um, but US, Canada, Germany, Japan, Italy, France, UK, get together politically and try to arrange some things economically. Kind of, right, no comparison but what SCO may be with a lot of luck in G7 decline. Um, Bretton Woods, so New Hampshire, post-World War II, really into World War II through, you know, the modern international economic system was born in New Hampshire with the Bretton Woods Institution, IMF, World Bank, and so on. Um, China has this very small, nascent, um, <coughs> untested, new, Asia Infrastructure and Investment Bank as a competitor to the World Bank. Not equal, but I'm trying to lay out something for the longer. The dollar, we know it's a global reserve currency. Um, trade occurs in US dollars, so if Canadians want to sell something to um, Saudis, the transaction is done in US dollars. And many countries hold, use, hold US dollars. China would like to see their, their currency, the yuan, a, a bigger currency. Um, it's, I think it's the eighth widely held global currency. So again, not very high. Dollars, euros, yens, all sorts of other things. So not quite, quite there. Something probably more significant though is, and this is my China-Iran picture, um, sanctions. U.S. imposes sanctions on Iran. China can counter by giving a $5 billion investment to Iran. So offsetting everything that the U.S. and its partners want to do uh, to offset it. Um, another real competition is what does the internet look like? You know, the, again, the internet was really sort of born in the United States. 1969, first connection, Stanford, UC San Diego, I think Denver, uh, and I think UC Santa Barbara. The U.S. internet is a global internet. Both China and Russia are creating their own internets. Um, and we still think U.S. foreign policy, a free global open internet, is a good thing for the world. Uh, but China has, you've heard of the Great Firewall, they block websites. Russia, they've been able to sort of segment their network and actually turn it off. Uh, can't do that in the U.S. Uh, and, and we don't like that very much. And, and part of the Huawei sort of thing is that the U.S. objections is because it would um, really give Chinese government greater, potentially greater control over the internet around the world. Um, and then the last one too, I think is real, the competition. You know, conventional war, China and Russia can match the United States in certain areas. And that's sort of a fact. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's something new. And, and that both countries have sort of been watching. The US is, you know, we start a, a new sort of war uh, about every three and a half years. China and Russia have been taking notes. And so they look at how they could counter the United States. And then they also, so in most places, they don't want to go head-to-head -head with the United States. So they've been developing concepts. You may have heard of hybrid, gray zone, um, that you're not going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe, uh, with the United States. So in some places, uh, you can't. And uh, you know, the US can't guarantee success. Uh, so I'm going to, so the, I said at the night, because I know you're an interactive group, and I've got a bunch of different sections. So I want to pause there and maybe just talk about sort of, you know, what's, what you think about sort of at least GPC in these terms uh, before I get into sort of a China section and the Russia section and then a U.S. section. Sure. And I think there's a mic. Yes. I guess if I walk, yeah, I have a question. Anyway, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I hope you'll address at some point the so-called uh, Thucydides paradox. Yeah, Thucydides trap. Paradigm or whatever. Yeah. And uh, 
big, you know, small, you know, rising power competing with the existing power. I mean, I'm, you've written more about that. It, they interest in your viewpoint. Sure. Yeah, no, my, my colleague up at Harvard is Graham Allison, and so his book, he, Graham coined the term Thucydides trap. Uh, and, and so the basic idea is the status quo power today, the United States, and the rising power today, China. Um, and he, you know, he, he kind of, the book is called Destined for War, there's a question mark. And he doesn't think the U.S. and China are destined for war. But he does say he's concerned you know, that both countries are, have the potential to sleepwalk into war. Uh, and you know, the old idea, why do countries go to war, right, fear, honor, interest, uh, I think we would update it with miscalculation or stupidity, that the potential for miscalculation is really high. You know, when you start getting into situations, uh, you know, like this, you know, the potential of, you know, the Russian plane to, to just fall out of the sky and, right, hit a U.S. destroyer, or a uh, Russian fighter to bump into that, you know, potential for miscalculation is high. And, uh, and so what Allison really tried to highlight is this trap um, that, you know, the way war would, could break out is, you know, China sort of underestimates U.S. power and overestimates its own power. Um, but yeah, definitely, you know, the uh, Thucydides trap, again, Thucydides has become a household, at least my house, a uh, household name. Uh, and Allison's book has really helped with, uh, with, with that. What about intellectual property rights? Where do you fit that in that economic picture you're showing right now? Yeah, clearly different, you know, on intellectual property, clearly different thoughts. And, and, it's, and it's not just legal. Um, it's clearly different out, you know, the US uh, and many other countries value intellectual property. Um, China doesn't. Uh, in the phase one trade deal that was signed, you know, there were some clauses in there about China must strengthen its domestic law, but now the reality, I mean, I, when I often ask U.S. businesses, how do you, why do you manufacture in China? And, you know, they sort of see it, loss is really a cost of doing business. Um, and they just want to stay ahead of that innovation cycle to be able to kind of be competitive. The fear over the long term, you can't do that. Uh, and so they're looking for ways, and, and the U.S. and China too, they had an agreement in 20, it was Sunnydale <coughs> Summit between Obama and Xi, 12 I think, uh, you know, where they said, we won't target each other's industries for commercial value. It worked for a little bit, but you know, the, the old adage is there are two kind of companies in, a, in the U.S., those hacked by China, and those don't know they've been hacked by China. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, that's a serious, serious problem. And, and, you know, the other thing I sort of think about is cybersecurity. The U.S. government policy is largely laissez-faire, that it's up to companies, and, and they just released some new guidelines for contractors. But I think the implementation's over several years before even companies doing business with the U.S. government need to meet certain standards. And, and that's some of the structural thing that, that I think there's a difference. Yeah, there you go. So it's nice always to see a student here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, you started off by mentioning that the Secretary Kerry said it was very 19th century for Putin and Crimea. But just as we learned here about counter arguments being important, um, there's something healthy for the international system when new countries form and they blossom. You know, provided they form in a legal way, but it's helping. And, and on the other hand, there's a, there's a limited amount of real estate in the world, so a new country will always come at the expense of an existing country. But do you think great power rivalry will, you know, will sort of worsen that process, help it, will reach some kind of accommodation whereby in some form of succession are agreed upon? Um, yeah, I, I, I don't see the U.S. giving up its notion of peaceful resolution of disputes. I, I don't think, you know, again, because sort of in my discussions uh, in China, you know, it's, it's always like the trigger word for me is uh, in ancient times. You know, in ancient times, China spanned, you know, and down, down the list. It's like, well, yeah, but in ancient times, there was also the British Empire, the Japanese Empire, you know, so you can't sort of cling to this sort of imperial past uh, and want to engage in the global system as it is today sort of a post-imperial global system. So I think there's some areas that are just not sort of open for compromise. Um, and, you know, peaceful resolution dispute, I think, is one. 
you know, I think territorial claims. Uh, you know, when I jump to sort of the China, you know, one of the reasons, you know, this is sort of, you know, uh, maritime lover, right? But we like this map of China because it gives a nice maritime perspective. Some of it, what I always want to highlight is U.S. allies, right? South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, kind of Philippines. Um, and then, you, you know, you look from a Chinese perspective, they've got to look outward to the sea because those land borders were sort of disputed for a long time and largely, you know, largely settled or they can kind of creep really into the Russian Far East just because of population. So maybe that would be more like a soft sort of annexation. Um, but, you, you, you know, again, you, you look at, you know, Vietnam and China share a border of fog wars. Uh, so I think, you know, going out to the sea is, is sort of natural, but I don't see, you know, the U.S. or, or other countries in the region saying, yeah, it's the South China Sea, uh, because I think the Chinese line tends to be that, you know, it, it's, it's like Mexico claiming the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> it's an international waterway. Uh, and so I don't, you know, it depends on, I guess it depends on, the, you know, on the space uh, and how it's done. Um, and if there are other spaces sort of in, you know, in the, in the Russian sphere. Let me jump to Russia. Uh, so again, this is uh, uh, one perspective, um, you know, this sort of the encirclement narrative that, that at least some Russian leaders use, that the United States has been encircling Russia, uh, you know, not only with the doubling of NATO over the last, uh, since the mid-90s, uh, but also with deployments, uh, missile systems, and while we're very modest on the U.S. ballistic missile defense capability, it still bothers the Russians that we have. So if you know the Aegis platform, um, we have Aegis ashore uh, in Poland, and then the missiles are in Romania, or vice versa. Uh, and so, you know, even though we're, you know, that, that's primarily designed to defend against Iranian attack, but the Russians sort of highlight that as one of their issues. Um, but they sort of have this encirclement sort of perspective. In here, you know, I use a, maybe just go to the Putin quote, you know, I use an older one to say, look, this is not a new thing. This is not a reaction to President Trump or even President Obama. Uh, and again, so if I sort of predate Russia, uh, Soviet collapse around 86, I don't know when you would, we would say U.S.-Russia relations start crashing. I would probably go with about 98, 99 related to the Kosovo crisis. Uh, and it really said, you know, again, externally, Russia looks at the U.S. does conduct sort of a new military campaign about every three and a half years. You know, the newest one was Syria. You know, we have ground forces in Syria you know, prior to that. Um, Right, Iraq rebuilds to go after ISIS in 14. Prior to that, Libya in 11. You know, prior to that, right, Afghanistan, Iraq continue. Prior to that, Yugoslavia a couple times. Prior to that, Panama. So they sort of view this pattern uh, uh, with right suspicion and fear, and, and they attempt to sort of use it in a way to advance their foreign policy agenda. Uh, let's do that. You know, influence, right, we get a lot where uh, influence dangers. Um, so this was sort of the, the U.S. intelligence community assessment right before President Trump was inaugurated. And you, and you hear about election interference, concerns about that. Uh, less dramatic at the midterms in 18. You know, the argument is we know what to look for now. Also, it's harder to pick sides in midterm elections. It's much easier when it's a two-person race for a presidential election. But all eyes are on 2020, right, for sure. Uh, it's not the Soviet military, so that, that's where I'd say we can't be overly dramatic. Just one moment, sir. Uh, and so if you look at the bars, you know, the blue is Soviet military, the left one is ground compared to red, so tiny, navy, much smaller is the next one, and then air, the next, the next one. Still capable in some areas, uh, particular submarines. You know, they have a very good submarine force. Uh, and, uh, you know, relative to everything else. But you see some of the legacy platforms, right? Their aircraft carrier got a lot of great press as it sort of belched smoke on its way through the Mediterranean and then later sort of catching fire and dry dock and pretty unusable, I think. And same thing with a large amphibious ship. So it's not, 
that's where I, you know, again, it's not the Soviet Navy, but they've investing in other areas. You, you hear more about hypersonic weapons uh, in particular. Um, so they're looking for those sort of advantages. It's not, it's not the Soviet Union. Um, and then the other thing too, uh, you know, again, we, we, I think it is true, uh, people are the most important part of a military. Uh, they still, 60% are conscripts, you know, only 40% professional. And uh, so that would be sort of the other factor I would, I would sort of throw out. Not, let, it's important, some key technology areas, uh, but let's not get overly focused on conventional. Because I think that's sort of our comfort zone with the U.S. is we, we want to think conventional conflict and we'll miss all the other stuff. That, that would be my concern to include uh, cyber. So, yes, sir. Shortly after the, uh, the Russian government became Russian rather than Soviet, the uh, squadron of their ships made a good little visit here in Newport, to the station Newport. And I have to be here at the time, and I was one of those who was uh, assigned to pay attention. And, uh, and it was uh, every Russian officer who came ashore who was competent in English, and they all, when we compared notes afterwards, they all had the same message. All we want is to be respected as naval professionals, period. Okay? Not whose name is bigger, who's better, and all that stuff. And, and it seemed that you know, we passed the word up and it left Newport. We were going to have to I couldn't tell you. But uh, subsequent attitudes in Washington seemed to ignore the opportunity that message had for some kind of a partnership, professionally speaking. What year was it, roughly? It would have been early 90s. Okay. And I, my compliment to them was, it's so good to see that you got your naval ensign back with St. Andrew's Cross. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I, I don't disagree. I mean, I, I used to play darts with a Russian officer at NATO military headquarters, 98. And then we had this whole falling out. Uh, yeah, there, there is sort of that feeling of mutual respect of what's driving that. Um, we had Russian officers here at the Naval War College in the mid-90s for five or six years. Yeah. And so there was a thaw. We've never had PLA here. We did have Russian here. And, and so, the, you know, there is uh, a lot of, there's a lot of work to be done to sort of rebuilding those relationships. Maybe I felt that the guys in Washington seem to be the ones who dropped the ball because you know those guys would have all come ashore with the same message yeah. it didn't come right from the Kremlin. Yeah, no, and, and it's, uh, I would say too, it's not all bad. Uh, let me get to the, the, so view from Alaska, right, we get stuck with this, uh, at least I get stuck with this view from Alaska. So you've got sort of Russia reconstituting Soviet bases up in the Arctic, and you know the idea at some point the, the that becomes a regular navigable uh, way to move uh, goods and or goods from Northeast Asia to Europe cheaper, faster, easier. Um, and then you know it's a it's a pretty regular routine. Um, you know U.S. or Canadian fighters intercepting Russian bombers. Um, that you know that still goes on, uh, and we sort of forget about it way down here in, in Rhode Island. Uh, okay, so the hard scenario, I guess, would be sort of, there's a bunch of hard scenarios with Russia. I just sort of stuck with defend the Baltics. Um, and because Russians, you could, Russia could walk into our allied countries. China can't walk into Japan. They still got to get on some ships or fly in. At least the Russians, they can just walk in. Because, um, you know, the, the U.S. allies border that, uh, those countries. Uh, and certainly, I, I think those countries have deep concern about uh, Russia. Uh, and so this is sort of the hard scenario. And if you've seen over the last year-ish, year plus, uh, the U.S. has really been increasing its exercise frequency uh, in Europe and, and sort of building up in that space. But I'm going to get to the, the good part. Um, so first, Russia and China, they're not the same. Right? As a professor, I wish we didn't lump them together. Because uh, they're really different, you know, China's economy is about 10 times out of Russia, same on population, 
Russia is a real nuclear power. You know, 20 times more nuclear warheads than China. And so nuclear arms control to me is important. Um, defense spending, again, you can see huge differences. Um, and then, you know, I, I just sort of use the submarines. You, you know, nuclear propulsion gives you right global reach, unrefuelable, or less refuelable than like diesel, where you gotta stop and get gas along the way. Um, you know, where China is still diesel-centric, so operating very well in Northeast Asia. It's got good enough range, uh, but you know, as I start thinking global versus regional power, propulsion, basing, that, that kind of gives them that capability. Um, what, are, what is the U.S. doing about it? So the third piece, right, I said competition at the start, U.S., China, Russia, I want to give you a sense of U.S. defense strategy. So we got sort of the three big bullets guiding us. You know, one is just get more lethal. And so you saw the U.S. withdrew from the uh, Intermediate Range Nuclear Treaty, the IMF, and we are on fast track to build out medium range ballistic missiles um, to give more capability. You saw maybe the news today, the U.S. Navy is de deploying a low yield nuclear warhead on its boats, uh, submarines. Um, you see the Navy, U.S. Navy developing, um, you know, again, Tomahawk missiles that can target uh, moving ships. Um, that sort of disappeared for a while. Developing new, uh, longer range anti-ship missiles, that's sort of new. Uh, hypersonics, um, that's got a lot of attention. Our acting secretary of Navy, uh, Mobley, he's been putting out a weekly note. So if you remember when Admiral Zumwalt put out those Z-grams way back in the 70s, Admiral, uh, or uh, Secretary Mobley is putting out vectors. The last one was all about hypersonics, that we need to catch up to the Chinese and the Russians and get these weapons deployable. Um, the, the one I highlighted, strengthen allies and partners, huge. Uh, and then the third one is just spend, right, spend more money wisely. Uh, but I want to dwell on allies and partners because I started talking about this a bit. So the first column is the year 2000 and then to today-ish. Status of force, that's countries that say you can put military forces in your country. It has tripled to about 120, the SOFA agreements, over the last 20 years. There is no country willing to, you know, uh, that's willing, there's every country is willing to host U.S. forces in some form or fashion. Um, and that's a big deal, to, to be able to put U.S. military in another country. Uh, NATO has doubled in size, and we should hit number 30 this year. Um, foreign military financing, it's grants Congress gives to help other countries defend themselves. With hardware, IMET, SEND, uh, other countries to their officers and enlisted to U.S. schools. And so here at the Naval War College, we've got, I think this year, probably 60-something uh, countries, 68, 7, 5, mid-60s countries send officers to the U.S. to study with us. And they're a fantastic part of our program um, through IMET. Uh, and then foreign military sales. This is when countries bring their own money. You can see it's right, clean tuppled in 20 years. So this is Japan, Norway, Australia, Saudi Arabia, UK. Um, very few countries in the world produce advanced fighter aircraft, for example. Um, and so they, they come to the US. Uh, and that's good you know, for us in a lot of respects. As I said, one more F-35 in theater, but it does have you know, the, the, the ability to lower costs uh, over the long term, because the more you Right, the more you sell, then you can offset those research and development costs. And so that's a huge part of U.S. strategies, uh, strengthening partners and, and allies. Uh, let me see that. Yeah, let me stop. Let me stop there because we're kind of close to 6:55. So I try to work in your questions throughout. But you know, let me go on. You know, I do want to say maybe I will do because. But I like this, you know, again, sort of idea from the national security strategy that there's no arc of history. It requires the United States to actively advance some agenda. We have to do something more than oppose uh, something. Um, we have to really articulate some alternative that others would find attractive. And, uh, and so we can't forget about that. That it's got to be a positive sort of message. Uh, and, you know, like I said, in the 90s, it was about expanding democracy and capitalism. Uh, today, I think it's trying to, we would say, defend the rules-based order, uh, but it cuts both ways. That the U.S. has to play by these rules, too. 
and, and that's where we get into the, you know, the, the other lecture I'll save some, some other colleague to explain the U.S. policymaking process and how we tariff our allies. But, but that's the hard part of all this. Okay, now, so any, any final thoughts? Yeah, here you go. Thanks, it's a general question. So, with respect to the two GPC players, is there hostile intent more communism, or is it because of nationalism? In, in our case, at least in the case of China, you know, a big player, Germany's quest for a place in the sun. And the reason why I'm asking this is because it's nationalism then. Back in 1945, few could have imagined the PRC being the kind of formidable challenger it is today to our interests. So, looking at the rest of the world, who do you, uh, which country, countries do you predict would, you know, could be in a similar situation, you know, 40 years from now, Brazil, India, Iran? Will they have hostile intent to the U.S. or not? Why not? And what would we do about it? Yeah, so I'll, I'll be optimistic and say no. Uh, you know, the, the one thing, the, it's, I think this is largely true. I mean, the U.S. has less historical imperial baggage than other countries, and, and so, um, I, I think the greater challenge, you know, you know, it's back to sort of, I would almost put the greater challenge is U.S. domestic politics. Is, is it, does the U.S. want to continue to play a leadership role in the world? Um, and, and I think the short answer is, I can't, I don't know. But, but I think that would be on the long term, and whether the power vacuum is created. Uh, I think the U.S. doesn't, um, you know, even under President Trump, you know, you know uh, Peter Thiel, uh, you know, one of the PayPal founders, said something like, "You got to take him seriously, not literally. <laughs> seriously, but not literally." So when he says, you know, when he says something like, "Right, al allies are uh, unhelpful and expensive," well, what he's really saying is, "Right, we want allies to do more." Right. So NATO, go to the Middle East. Uh, and, and when I sort of reflect on military operations, modern military operations are coalition. Um, you know, even, I'm probably go back all military operations. I mean, the American Revolution was a coalition operation. You know, the French landed at the other end of Newport Harbor in Lafayette. We've always fought in coalitions. It's rare we fight alone. Mm -hmm. and, and so I, I think on that serious point, but you know, there's sort of that, there's that expectation or the, the misperception, I would say, is, uh, you know, the U.S. is the biggest sucker in the world. <laughs> and, and so we lose uh, right on trade, we lose, lose on allies. Uh, and so that, that sort of fuels how engaged should we be. Um, and, and I think partly what drove the, you know, again, this is my speculation, the drafters of the National Defense Strategy to write great power competition not terrorism. Some of that's a frustration, you know, that we've got right entire generation, entire generation of military and foreign service that have spent thinking about terrorism and counterinsurgency and stability operations. So there is some internal dynamic too. Uh, but I think the bigger threat, you know, I guess I would sort of put it back on: Does the U.S. want to continue in this role, um, and uh, and how that would change? And, and that's where I think our allies and partners need to kind of keep saying, I thought the French uh, defense minister said something great today or yesterday, you know, about the importance of the United States. And we probably need to hear that more, uh, I would say. It's exactly 7 o'clock. <laughs> tremendous amount um, and uh, so thanks for your questions and coming tonight and thank you George let me turn it back to you all right thank you another round of applause please for Dr. Rosen. Like the good doctor said, that's uh, that's wrap up time. So at seven o'clock, thank you so much again for joining us. Uh, another wonderful presentation. Thank you, sir. And uh, we've got another one scheduled in in a month. So hopefully we'll see you then. Thanks so much. Get home safe.